All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Today we have a particularly momentous Authors at Google talk today. Um, there are some presidents that truly changed the course of human events, and there are some writers that really um, changed their craft a a as well. Um, today we're very fortunate to have two in one. We're hosting Edmund Morris today um, to, as we welcome him to Google. Now, I personally have had an armchair interest in the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt ever since having to write a, a thesis paper about the um, Moroccan foreign policy of Theodore Roosevelt back in undergrad. Um, but I can safely say that even looking at that, um, Theodore Roosevelt is probably the, Amer the greatest American president. I think that's, um, that's a pretty easy, easy question to answer. But he's also the one I'd say most like Chuck Norris. Um, from his career as a, a statesman, naturalist, historian, and just all-around awesome person, he controlled his own destiny, uh, his own progressive destiny. Um, his varied interests and his sense of and his sense of do no evil also make him a very um, googly individual as well. Now, in his book Colonel Roosevelt, um, Edmund wraps up his uh, his trilogy of the life of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, it, the journey began over 31 years ago with the, the research and publication of the Pulitzer Prize winning Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, which, ha which covered everything up until the assassination of, of President McKinley and the, the rise of Theodore Roosevelt to the presidency. And then, uh, and then a few years ago, he published um, Theodore Rex, which is but a continuation of the uh, strenuous life that, that TR led. Um, Colonel Roosevelt paints the legacy of, of the president after he left the White House. Now, Edmund Morris has dedicated his life to the biographical craft. Um, in addition to writing this opus on, on, the, on President Roosevelt, he's also written an acclaimed biography of, of Ronald Reagan, the so-called Dutch book, as well as a biography on Beethoven. So with that, please join me in, in welcoming Edmund to Google as he um, speaks to us on Colonel Roosevelt. Thank you, Cliff. That's the most flattering introduction I've had since I showed up in a Berkeley bookstore a few years ago. My escort wasn't available, so I had to introduce myself. <laughs> I've been um, overcome by a weird sense of nostalgia in the last half hour or so. Nostalgia in, in, uh, in quotes because when I came to this country as an immigrant in 1968, I was a young copywriter in a New York advertising agency, and I was hired to work on the least glamorous account at Ogilvy and Mather, which was IBM Recruitment. I had to write ads that recruited staff for IBM facilities around the country. So within weeks of uh, arriving in this strange new world, I found myself being sent on planes around the country to IBM facilities which were rather like space stations. They were so strange to me. I guess they were the equivalent in their time of this campus I'm standing in right now. But then, in 1968, all these facilities, which spread over the landscape of Texas and Minnesota and Upper New York State, were identical. All the guys who worked there had little crew cut, flat top crew cuts, white shirts, thin ties, trousers hiked up a little too high so it showed ankle and socks. For some weird reason, that was part of the uniform. They looked alike, they spoke alike, they dressed alike, they were indistinguishable. I remember standing at a window in a facility in, um, in Austin, Texas, as I've been standing at this window, watching the guys getting ready to go to lunch. There was a huge parking lot outside, full of enormous cars, late, late 60s cars with wingtips. And at quarter to one, just as when I was standing at this window, 15 minutes to one, the doors of the facility opened and out from Multiple doors came, all these guys in white shirts with crew cuts rushed into their F Ford Fairlanes, jumped in, slammed the doors, then jumped out again and ran back into the building. So I asked the guy I was with, what, what's this lemming-like maneuver here I'm seeing? He said, oh, they're just switching on their air conditioning systems because they get off at one and when they get out, 
and get into the car, it'll be nice and cool. Nothing could be more different, and yet in a way more samey to what I'm seeing today. The best and the brightest, the youngest and most enterprising, working in computer technology. And for a guy like me who was brought up with a fountain pen and books and paper and ink, who still thinks in terms of paper and ink, uh, this visit to me is an enrapturing experience and it's like a new world that I wish I could belong to. Now to backtrack to um, the years before 1968, I should perhaps explain to you why and how I got interested in Theodore Roosevelt. I was born and brought up in Nairobi, Kenya. We pronounced it Kenya in those days, it's now Kenya. Um, I was born and brought up in this house which um, was a two acre property on the edge of, of, this, of this city. There was a river at the bottom of our plot, a muddy river jerking with bilharzia bugs. There was a bamboo forest on the other side. And a 10 year old boy, myself, could cross this river, snake through the tight stalks of the bamboo forest and look out into an enchanted garden of the property opposite ours. It was a large gray stone house with bougainvillea over the roof and gardeners switching, swashing their, their scythes. And a little old lady would sit on the porch reading. Lady Macmillan. I knew that she was the widow of a famous American, William Northrop Macmillan, who was long dead at the time that I first saw her. But that American, that wealthy American, had built this gray stone house in the teens of the last of the, of the 20th, 19th, uh, 20th century. And although I didn't know it then, he had been the host to former President Roosevelt in 1910 when TR left the White House and came to Kenya on a massive safari for the Smithsonian Institution. Now, if only I'd been 40, born 40 years before, I could have snaked through those same bamboo trees, looked at that same house, at that same veranda, and I probably would have seen a portly, famous American in a pith helmet with a big mustache sitting there on the porch writing his book, African Game Trails. I could have perhaps gone up to him and said, Mr. President, for a future biography about you, would you grant me an interview? However, my only conscience of him as a small boy was a picture of him that I saw in a civic history. I guess I was about 12 years old. It showed this, this American face with a big mustache and a lot of teeth and a pith helmet. I don't know what it was about that image, but it, um, it registered on me. He looked as though he would be fun. At that stage, I was already infatuated with the United States. I'd read uh, the novels of Tom, of Mark Twain, Tom Sawyer, and Huckleberry Finn, and I love, long to live in this country. So 25 years went by, and I found myself here, a young copywriter, and gradually my career mutated into that of a professional writer. In the mid-1970s, I discovered Theodore Roosevelt as a biographical subject who attracted me for some mysterious reason, and I began to write about him. A screenplay, which I thought, I wrote speculatively, hoped I could sell to CBS, sort of mini-series. I called it The Dude from New York. Unfortunate title, because when it was announced, a producer did option it. And when it was announced in Variety magazine that um, this producer had acquired the rights to Edmund's, Edmund Morris's screenplay, The Dude from New York, he was inundated with applications to play the lead role from out-of-work black actors who thought it was a hood movie. The screenplay, however, did, um, although it was never produced, did mutate into a book. My agent said to me, since you've written the screenplay, why not write a book about him? He's a famous American president and you could probably sell a few copies. So she got me an advance of $7,500 payable one quarter down, 
and told me to go ahead. And four years later, I produced The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, a massive 888-page biography, which ended with the prince of all cliffhangers, taken directly from my movie script, of Theodore Roosevelt, 42 years old, Vice President of the United States, standing on top of Mount Marcy, the highest point of New York State, and seeing a ranger running up through the trees with a telegram for him, a telegram announcing that President McKinley had been assassinated and that he was the next President of the United States. There's no way any writer could go beyond a, a, a final page like that. So I ended the book with that cliffhanger and that presupposed that I would have to write a sequel about TR's presidency from 1901 to 1909. A presidency which exactly coincided with the leap of the United States into the rank of great nations, the emergence of the United States as a world power. When this young, lusty, all-American figure, supremely sophisticated, cosmopolitan, international, personified and embodied the young, emergent United States. I wrote a book about that presidency, had a bit of difficulty getting it going because um, I found, this is now the year 1980, 81, somewhere around there, I found that writing about the White House 100 years ago was difficult because I didn't really understand presidential politics. I was not a trained scholar of politics. I wasn't particularly interested in politics. And it, it became difficult. Miraculously, Ronald Reagan was elected president at that time. And one of the first things he did after he uh, moved into the White House in January 1981 was read my first book, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt simply out of curiosity about one of his predecessors. All presidents, I've discovered, are curious about the other members of their very small and exclusive club. They like to read books about one another. They like to study one another. So Reagan read my book. And uh, next thing I knew, my wife and I were being invited to a state dinner in the White House in August of 1981 to meet the president which I did, and um, a few days after this meeting, I began to hear from his, uh, his guys, his aides, that if I wanted to write a biography of Ronald Reagan, to observe him in the White House, to follow him around, interview him, schmooze with members of his family and his friends, if I wanted to do that, the president would probably say yes. And to my enormous shame, I must confess that I said no. Uh, because I didn't think Ronald Reagan was very interesting. He struck me as likable and I suppose um, potentially a good president, but he had nothing like the complexity and the mystery and the drama, and the fascination of the guy I was trying to write about, Theodore Roosevelt. So I rejected these advances, continued to struggle with Theodore Rex, and began to regret it because by 1983, Reagan's presidency was beginning to look more and more interesting, more and more momentous, more and more historical. A huge confrontation was developing between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, the SDI was being developed. So I began to regret turning these overtures down. And to cut a long story short, in 1985, after Reagan had been reelected, I thought I may as well go to the top, and I wrote a letter to his wife, <laughs> Nancy, proposing that I did do this biography, if she would be agreeable, and the president would agree, to me be able, being able to come and go at the White House, observe the presidency in action, and write about him afterwards. So that's how my book, Dutch, A Memoir of Ronald Reagan, began. And I spent 15 years writing that rather strange book. One day in the White House, after a couple of months or so, I was sitting at a senior staff meeting, and I was kind of bored because one of the unwritten secrets about the White House is that most of the president's daily routine is pretty damn boring. It's grip and grins, handshakes, and 
honoring Thanksgiving turkeys and all that kind of nonsense. So I found myself doodling a few paragraphs of Theodore Rex on a yellow legal pad while I was sitting listening to this boring meeting. And at the end of the meeting, forgot about it, and I was walking off toward the Oval Office. I had an interview with the president later that day. And one of the young secretaries came running after me. Mr. Morris, Mr. Morris, you've forgotten your notes. I'd left them on the table. I said, oh, thank you. And she said, sir, you ought to be more careful about national security. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it says here the president's plotting a revolution in Panama. I realized then no man can serve two masters. I've got to concentrate on Reagan and forget about TR. But after I'd finished that book and published it in 1999, I went back to the manuscript of Theodore Rex, understanding how the White House worked, because I'd seen it in action, understanding the theater of presidential power. Whatever you think or thought about Ronald Reagan, he knew how to dramatize great events. He had a masterly gift of timing, a masterly command of oratory, and all these gifts which were shared by Theodore Roosevelt, these gifts of theater, translate into real power. So I went back and wrote uh, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, intending to publish it on September the 15th, 2001, that being the centenary of the day that TR became president. Fortunately, the manuscript was late, and they had to delay publication until November of 2001, because if I had published on the 15th of September 2001, just four days after 9-11, after I probably would have sold about nine copies. Nobody in that traumatized time was reading any books whatsoever. It came out, and um, I uh, needed some respite after this big presidential book, so I wrote a short biography of Beethoven, just for the fun of it, and then wrote this book, which of all the books I've written is the one I've enjoyed most, simply because it tells the story of an enormous presidential personality. Probably the richest and most complex personality we've ever had in the White House. Abraham Lincoln was great, George Washington was great, FDR was great. This is acknowledged by all presidential historians. But Theodore Roosevelt, of all our great presidents, was the one who had the widest range of interests and experiences. He was a bona fide intellectual who, apart from his political gifts, which were extraordinary, was a professional historian, a biographer, a paleontologist, an ornithologist, um, a cosmopolitan who spoke three languages and read in four. He read a book a day on average, flicking over the pages at the speed of three to four pages a minute, photographing them in his retentive memory so perfectly that after 10, 15 years, he could replicate and quote extensively books that he'd read at this extraordinary rate of speed. He, he pulsated with knowledge. He pulsated with sophistication. He was at home in any society. He'd been a teenage student in Germany. He'd had four grand tours of Europe before he was 30. He had a range of acquaintance extending from Japan to Scandinavia to Russia to South America. He was an explorer. He was um, such an expert uh, biologist that sometimes during his presidency, the Smithsonian would send specimens around to the White House to have the president identify them. He was the ranking expert in the United States on the North American game mammals. And all this was before he left um, the White House and embarked on the series of adventures that comprise Colonel Roosevelt. He left the United States because he was aware that his hand-picked successor, President William Howard Taft, would be overwhelmed by his personality if he remained. TR was so large and flamboyant, was so beloved of the press, he knew he had to get out of the country, otherwise this rather dull Republican stooge that he'd put in the White House was going to have a hard time carving out an individual profile. 
So off TR went to Africa. He spent more than a year away in the land of my birth, blasting away at elephants and rhinos and lions, accumulating specimens for the Smithsonian, completely out of touch with the outside world. So much so that when he came down the Nile in the spring of 1910 to resume his, um, his, his, re his retirement, he was astonished to see that the Khartoum was full of American and European correspondents waiting for him because during this year in Africa, he had become willy-nilly the most famous man in the world. This former president, this Nobel Prize winner who had vanished into the wilds of Africa. Not only were reporters and correspondents wanting to interview him and talk to him about the deteriorating political situation in the United States and was he gonna come back and be run for president again, but there were sheaf upon sheaf upon sheaf of invitations, embossed invitations with crowns on them from all the crowned heads of Europe, the kings, the emperors, for him to come and stay in their palaces, to tour Europe. So next thing he knew, he was indeed, indeed doing that, embarking on a marathon grand tour of all the European capitals, Italy, uh, Vienna, Hungary, France, Scandinavia, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and in each of these countries, he was put up in these palaces and treated with such veneration by all the crowned heads um, that he realized they all believed that he was going to become president again, and they were courting him. He felt wherever he went with his acute sense of history and his knowledge of military coming uh, military fluctuations, he could sense that a gigantic war was coming that would engulf all Europe. He sensed it most powerfully on a military field in Germany in May of 1910, when he stood, sat on a horse, there's a photograph of it in the book, beside the German Kaiser and saw this great military machine, the German Wehrmacht, exercising on the plain of Doberitz. And when he went back to his rooms that night, he said to his wife, we're in for it. A war is coming that is going to destroy the, um, the civilization of the old world. As it happened, King Edward VII of Britain died while he was, TR was still in Germany. So he found, it, he found himself appointed by President Taft as special representative of the United States to King Edward's funeral. So it came about that on that perfect spring day of May 1910, when the last of the great imperial processions began in London, an emperor after emperor, potentate after potentate, went down Whitehall in their glittering carriages, jiggling with epaulets and busbies and finery. And in the midst of them marched this plain American in his plain business suit, representing the dignity of the coming republic. TR marched, surrounded by all the crowned heads who within a few short years were going to be at their, each other's throats, engulfed in World War I, and almost all of whom never survived that war. So you can understand that when he came back to the United States in June of that year, to the greatest welcome that New York City had ever extended to any uh, returning hero, over a million people up Fifth Avenue he seemed to be coming back to an inheritance. He was only 51 years old, full of political potential. Nobody doubted that TR would run again in 1912 to become president for the third time. Nobody except himself. He wanted to have a literary retirement to continue writing books and he did not want to get involved in politics again. And part of the tragedy of the story is that he was co-opted back into the game a progressive movement had arisen in America of young, idealistic, middle-class people who identified with him and his gradual leftward swing as president and wanted him to lead them in the elections of 1910, exactly 100 years ago, and the presidential election of 1912. It's a complex political story, which I won't get into now, but 
To his reluctance, he found himself in the spring of 1912 running for the Republican nomination against President Taft. And although his uh, primary wins across the country were overwhelmingly in his favor, enough states were still controlled by the Republican organization in those days that the president was renominated, and TR had to bolt the party, form a third party consisting of his young progressive supporters, the Progressive Party of 1912, which quickly earned the nickname of the Ball Moose Party. TR led it and uh, personified it. It's the most successful uh, third party campaign we've ever mounted in this country. Even though he knew very well, it was absolutely impossible for him to be elected because he had split the Republican Party. It was therefore foreordained that the Democratic candidate, Woodrow Wilson, was going to be president. However, TR did lead this amazingly forward-looking campaign, promoting a social and legislative agenda which was so radical for its time that some of its precepts did not come about until the New Deal administration of Franklin Roosevelt, 20 years later. On October 14th, 1912, at the height of the campaign, T.R. had a speech to deliver in Milwaukee. He'd been speaking all day and his high, scratchy voice was very fatigued, but he insisted on going through with his final speech of the day, which was after dinner that night. He checked into his hotel for dinner, came down shortly before eight o'clock, stepped out onto the sidewalk outside. A big open limo was waiting for him to climb into. There was a crowd in the street who cheered him as he climbed into the limo with his Secret Service guys and some members of the Progressive Party. And as they cheered him, T.R. took off his hat and stood up and acknowledged the cheer, waving. And at that moment, a young, short, dull-eyed, blonde young man stepped forward and let off a shot which hit him right in the chest. The bullet went through his heavy overcoat, his coat, his vest, his shirt, oh, and in the vest pocket, his speech, which was folded over, 50-page speech, which makes 100 pages of thick paper, his steel spectacle case. The bullet went through all his impedimenta, bashed into a rib very close to the heart, and lodged there. If it had gone a fraction of an inch more, and if there had been not so many impedimenta in its way, he would have died on the spot. But Theodore Roosevelt being Theodore Roosevelt, one of our consummate showmen and a guy of serious macho um, capabilities, insisted on going through with his scheduled speech, even though he knew he had a bullet in his chest. I would not go to the hospital, he said. Take me to the auditorium. So they took him to the auditorium. He stepped out on stage. There had been a short announcement before he stepped out. His, um, one of his guys came forward and said, ladies and gentlemen, the Colonel Roosevelt has been shot, but he's all right and he wants to speak to you tonight. So while the audience was reacting to this introduction, out comes T.R looking gray-faced and slightly tottery, but nevertheless striding forward to the lectern. And he pulled out of his pocket the speech he was about to deliver, and only then noticed that the speech had been perforated by this bullet. There's a photograph of it in my book. And somehow the sight of that speech with these holes through it shocked him into the realization of what had really happened to him. He opened his coat and he found this blood stain spreading across his shirt front. And he shrieked out in his falsetto voice, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. <laughs> you can imagine the audience absolutely paralyzed with shock. He spoke for 90 minutes, occasionally teetering from side to side. They were afraid he might fall over the edge of the stage, but he got through the speech and only then was he, did he consent to being taken to hospital and a couple of weeks later recovered uh, a 
a pretty damaged person, but nevertheless, he did recover, and he carried that slug in his chest for the rest of his life. Although he won an enormous sympathy vote as a result of this melodramatic performance, he nevertheless was defeated for the presidency in 1912. Woodrow Wilson became president. And a giant personal confrontation between Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson began slowly to develop. And the story of the confrontation between these two men, these two superbly equipped political intellectuals, is a large part of the second half of my story. However, it is not exclusively a political story. In fact, um, it's very largely the story of, of an intellectual, a literary man, and a gentleman adventurer who recovered from that um, election campaign of 1912 by going off to South America in the fall of 1913 to explore an unknown river, which was a tributary of the Amazon. The Rio da Duvida, the river of doubt. He did it um, partly because he wanted, he lusted for adventure, partly because, as he explained to a friend, it was my last chance to be a boy, and partly because the Brazilian government were very keen for him to do it, to perform this exploration and to write a book about it afterwards which would um, publicize the interior of Brazil. So that's what happened. But he didn't bargain for the fact that this trip, this trip down the River of Dart, turned out to be a nightmarish expedition of horror in which he very nearly died of a, com a combination of abscesses and malaria. Uh, reached such a point of delirium, in fact, that he thought he was dying and he begged to be left alone so that the rest of the expedition could continue down the river and get back to civilization. They dragged him with him, with them, and uh, at a rather poignant moment toward the end of the expedition, he was photographed standing on the edge of the river. The book, the, there's a picture in the book which I got from Brazil, of him standing looking like a skeleton as his uh, Brazilian counterpart, pa counterpart, Colonel Emilio Rondon, baptized the river in his name as the Rio Roosevelt. It's still the Rio Roosevelt to this day, a river longer than the Rhine, but the Brazilians have great trouble pronouncing the word Roosevelt, so it's generally known in Brazil as the Rio Teodoro, Teddy's River. He was a frail man when he came back from that expedition, uh, recovered eventually, became rather portly, but as the years progressed, 1914, 15, 16, and as America became embroiled in World War I, the bugs in his system, the toxins left over from Brazil, began to multiply. He suffered increasingly from malarial attacks and various uh, medical problems, which sapped his superhuman energy. And by 1918, as his 60th birthday approached, even though it was generally agreed that he was the assert to be renominated by the Republican Party in 1920 for the presidency, he knew that he was on the way out. In fact, he knew when he left Harvard as a young undergraduate, as a young graduate, that he would die at the age of 60. His doctor detected at that time there was something wrong with his heart and said that he would have to live a sedentary life. And TR said, doctor, I'm going to live life to the hilt until I'm 60 and then I'm going to die. And with great promptness, he did indeed die at the age of 60 on January the 6th, 1919, the Feast of the Epiphany. I think I've gone on uh, long enough about his life because I believe um, this is a democracy and you guys might like to ask some questions about him. And I can only say in concluding um, this short presentation that um, the 30 years I've spent writing about this man, even though they were interrupted by Reagan and by Beethoven, have been, um, have been such fun such fun. He was so funny, he was so flamboyant, and so important, and so sophisticated. 
so admirable that although I've never fallen in love with him, it's very dangerous for biographers to fall in love with their subjects. Even though there are aspects of him that I find repulsive, particularly his strange desire to kill animals in, in large numbers, and his desire to die in battle, these things I've never understood. In spite of all those qualifications, he has been fun to write about. So I guess my instinct was correct at the age of 10 when I saw that picture and said to myself, he looks like fun, because here I am at age 70, and I find him uh, as much fun now as I did then. Thank you, everybody. All right, so I, I thought I'd start off with um, one question. Um, looking over Theodore Roosevelt's life, um, how, how did his um, family situation improve like after he left the presidency? I, I remember in the earlier books, you know, his ta talking about sending bullets from San Juan Hill up to the, the folks back home. So mm -hmm. how, how did he uh, manage his um, growing family life um, after the presidency? He was the father of six children, and unlike most presidents, he was interested in his children. <laughs> he was not like Ronald Reagan, who once, as governor of, Kenya, uh, governor of California, uh, participated in a diploma ceremony at Loyola University down in LA. And his own son, Michael, came before him to receive his degree. And Reagan handed him the diploma and said, congratulations, young man. And Michael said, Dad, it's me, Michael, your son. T.R. was not like that. He passionately identified with his children, his six children. Um, it, some of the letters he wrote them, some of the 150,000 letters that he perpetrated in his lifetime, some of the most delightful of these letters uh, are written to his children. Um, he uh, began to identify with them as adults in the course of this book. When he was in the White House, he had a young family they were still, most of them, children. But they were beginning to grow up by the time he, um, he launched into his post-presidential career. And um, he developed uh, relationships with them that I've gone into in quite some detail in the book. I'll speak only about his relationship with the youngest and the brightest, Quentin, his last son. Quentin was the son who was most like his father to such an extent that um, when t uh, World War I came about and all four boys went to fight on the Western Front, Quentin, the youngest, became a fighter pilot and was received everywhere he went in Europe as the living embodiment of his father, the teeth, the peering eyes, the brightness, the, 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 the intelligence, the his love of French, he was quintessentially French. He, he spoke like Frenchman and gesticulated. All these qualities he inherited from his father. But when that boy was killed in July of 1918, shot down by a German um, fighter pilot uh, outside of Reims, the shock of that death on Theodore Roosevelt was so profound that he himself began to die psychologically and physically from that moment onward. It was just a matter of months before he did in fact die. Another of the photographs in the book shows Quentin lying on the grass beside his crashed plane, looking like a steer fallen off a hook in an abattoir. And I think the brutal fact of his death uh, impacted on his father to such an extent that T.R. lost all his notions of romance in battle and died a disillusioned and heartbroken man. Yes, sir. One of the big events, and it's probably is in your previous book, not this book, is after T.R. was reelected in 1904, he announced that he was not going to run again in 1908, even though he could have. And do you know why he did that? And did he ever admit that he made a mistake? <laughs> Why did Theodore Roosevelt not accept another term to the presidency in 1908, which was handed him on a silver platter? He was only 48 years old. He'd um, had inherited his first term from President McKinley. He'd had a sensationally successful second term. He was young, full of power. He loved power. 
but he declined another term offered him by the party. Even though constitutionally he could have had it, in those days there was no constitutional restriction on how many terms a president could serve, but he pushed it away. And he did so for, I think, generally honorable reasons. He believed that the power of the presidency, which is supreme, is and should be finite. That the power was so great that if held too long, it would begin to corrupt. So he felt that two full terms as president were as much as any man could indulge without beginning to find in himself the seeds of corruption. So he pushed it away, this thing that he desired in his heart, in a genuinely noble gesture. And being human, having made that noble gesture, <laughs> began to hanker for it. I think even in Africa, he was beginning to wish that he could have stayed where he was. And by the time he came back and found what a mess President Taft was doing of things, this desire to resume power, to take it back, began to be compulsive. So I suppose you could say it was a tragedy for him that he did not manage to regain the presidency in 1912. But I must say, although I resist speculation for the most part, historical speculations are always foolhardy. If he had been elected president in 1912, he would have been in power when, in 1914, the nations of Europe came to the brink of war. Unlike Woodrow Wilson, he would have known all those emperors, all those heads of state, he would have known them, he, could, he spoke their languages, he had a Nobel Peace Prize in his pocket from his successful mediation of the Russo-Japanese War as president in 1906. I think those nations would have turned to him as a potential mediator of their differences. So it's not implausible to speculate that if TR had been president at that time, the war might have been averted or at least postponed or at least shortened and made less catastrophic. It's one of the great what-ifs of history. I was wondering what kind of documents you were able to rely on. You mentioned his letters. Was he also a diary writer, a journalist? I mean, what, what, what documentation did he leave that you could, you could look to? What documents did, uh, did I rely on? Well, like many, people who in youth sense that they are potentially great. There is this species of person who knows that he or she is going to be great one day. They keep every scrap of paper. And from a teenager onward, T.R., who was naturally a literate person, was constantly pouring out his thoughts on paper, constantly pouring out letters, books, articles, um, accumulated paper. So the record is fabulous. Um, not only are there those 150,000 letters, but um, all these books, these... And um, he even kept lunch receipts, for God's sake. I came across, in the Library of Congress repository of T.R.'s papers, something like 200 lunch vouchers from the Metropolitan Club in 1897, every single one of which was for <coughs> two lamb chops. I'm going through them in disbelief. Why he kept them, I don't know, but what it told me was in 1897, when the United States was beginning to gear up for a war with Spain over Cuba, the Spanish-American War, when he and his young friends in Washington were all campaigning to get this war going, at the Metropolitan Club, which was the hotbed of, of war preparations, what these lunch vouchers showed me that here was a young man so obsessed with these great imperial ambitions. He didn't care what he ate. He just ate the same things every day. Two lamb chops, two lamb chops. It was fuel for his, his, his mechanism. So in that way, uh, it's amazing what repositories will provide you, these, these strange, um, uh, tangible evidences of the past. Another was a diary that he wrote as a a student at Harvard. Every day of his student life, 
he wrote out all his activities, particularly his love affair with this gorgeous young Boston girl, Alice Hathaway Lee. How about that for a name? Alice Hathaway Lee. She was as beautiful as the name implies. Fell madly in love with her, so the, lo the love affair is chronicled on these pages. And um, he pursued her and got her to agree to marry him on the day that he graduated. So here am I reading his diary and getting off on his affair with this beautiful girl, who I must confess was beginning to attract me too. I was looking at pictures of her and I think, boy, this, this girl was cute. So naturally, being by nature of wire, which is what all biographers are, I wanted to see what it was like on the honeymoon night after he graduated and checked into this hotel with Alice in Springfield. So I turned the page, and there in his handwriting it says, our sacred happiness is too private to be written about. <laughs> and I distinctly felt myself addressed. <laughs> even at that age, even at that age, he knew that one day some beady-eyed biographer was going to be reading this diary, and he was in effect saying to that future person, this is private, keep out of this, this is my honeymoon night. So those are the kind of things one, um, kind of experiences one has in biographical research, and why indeed it is so much fun to write books of this kind, because there's nothing more interesting than reading other people's letters and diaries. Anybody else? After spending so many decades working on him, how are you going to pick what to write on, you know, what to write next or who to focus on next? After all these decades, what do I want to do next? Well, no more politicians, thank you very much. Um, no more presidents. I've written four enormous books. These three big books about TR who was an enormous personality, an enormous book about Ronald Reagan. So I think four enormous books is enough for any writer. I'm, I'm, I greatly enjoyed writing about Beethoven, which was a short book, something like 220 pages. Uh, for the first time, being able to describe somebody great, uh, a bona fide genius, in compact language, using language to express the inexpressible, music being a language which really is superior to speech, so that when one uses words to try and communicate the essence of music, it's, um, it's dauntingly difficult. But if you have a command of words, as I guess I was born with, it's my only, my only talent, to be able to chase up words which articulate music was an intensely exciting challenge. And I'd like to write more books about that, try to use language to communicate incommunicable things. I wouldn't mind writing about an artist, for example, or perhaps another composer, maybe another writer, but um, no more politicians. As Claire Booth Luce once said, politics is the refuge of second-class minds. And most politicians, with the exceptions of men like this, are pretty dull stuff. Yes? You mentioned at the beginning that uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, spoke three languages, so did he write some of his stuff in some language other than English, and did that make your research more difficult? Did Theodore Roosevelt write anything in languages other than English? No, he wrote no books in other languages. He read in Italian, and he spoke French and German pretty fluently. Uh, he did write a few French letters, which are um, surprisingly literate and pretty impeccable French. And German, he was familiar with enough to be able to quote long stretches of the Nibelungenlied in German and converse quite easily in it. But he preferred English. In fact, that was his natural language, and he wrote eloquently in it. So that's um, the extent of his uh, linguistic um, 
forays. I think I may have mentioned his photographic memory to you. And talking about language, you might like this particular example of how unique his memory was. I came across a letter that his son wrote him in 1914 from, his son was living in Brazil at the time. He said, Dad, can you remember a poem by some woman called e Edith Thomas called Far From Castile? And T.R. wrote back in his handwriting, I've, I've seen the letter, yes, Kermit, I do remember that poem. It goes like this, and he wrote it out, two long stanzas, about 18 lines of poetry, I thought, I, I'll check this out. I'll check, I, I looked up, I Googled <laughs> Edith Thomas. And sure enough, there was a poet by that name who had published a poem called Far From Castile in 1898. Now, Tiam was writing this in 1914. I thought, he can't remember that poem from 1898. It was published in the Atlantic Monthly, 1898. So I went to that magazine and looked up the poem. God damn it, it was almost word for word. So much so, I thought maybe he kept an old copy of that magazine, he just copied it out for his son in 1914. But then I noticed there were subtle differences. He mixed up one metaphor, used the phrase Gordian knot instead of Lycian triangle or something. Uh, he, sometimes he had two lines where in the ritual poem there were one, one or two punctuation differences, but otherwise, it was almost as though it had been photographed. It was absolutely uncanny. In 1914, he was remembering a poem published in 1898 and in a magazine which had an article by himself. So I surmise that when he wrote that article back in 1898, like all young writers, he, he bought the magazine in order to look at his own piece, found his own piece, and then noticed a poem as he was reading the magazine registered it in his mind, disgorged it perfectly 14, 15 years later. Really quite creepy. <laughs> yes, sir? Hi, I missed the first part of the talk, but I was wondering if you could comment on um, whether anything surprised you in your research for each successive book in the series. Um, anything, did your image of Roosevelt change at all um, when you moved from one book to another in any way that might have possibly challenge your, um, any of the views you took in an earlier book? Did my uh, image of him change in any way uh, during the course of writing the three books? Well, yes, I must say when I began this book, um, I didn't realize what a bona fide intellectual he was. I was aware of the fact he was a literary person. He'd written all these books, 40 books in total, but I didn't realize the depth of his mind as opposed to the breadth of it. But I came across this amazing series of articles that he began to write um, in 1911, when he was a contributing editor of the Outlook magazine, including one astonishing essay called The Search for Truth in a Reverend Spirit, which was about the conflict between evolutionary biology and religion, a subject which is as hot today as it was then. But in the course of writing this, article, but the conflict between evolutionary theory and religion, he read um, some 13 or 14 books in all these languages, uh, books on evolutionary theory, biology, um, ethnicity, theology, <coughs> and more. And he wrote this magnificent long essay, something like 20,000 words. It's an astonishing intellectual tour de force. In a year in which he was also writing articles about natural coloration in animals and political theory and uh, imagery, the, conf the, the difference between medieval imagery and the kind of imagery we used in the 20th century, he had an astonishingly rich, deep, fertile mind. And I must say, that was a discovery for me, and it, it, it knocked me out. Okay. I think we'll wind up with one s a small final question. Um, what, what piece of, the, of TR's life do you think is most relevant to, to us in, in you know, today's era, 100 years after, after his, um, his successes? What aspect of TR's life is most relevant to us now? In, in terms of leading our own strenuous lives. 
Well, his strenuosity is just something that um, everybody's aware of, and he who has energy should uh, use it to the max. I think his two greatest legacies are his conservationist philosophy. He was the first president, the first major American figure who put conservation on the ideological map. Uh, the conservation reforms, the national parks and monuments and wildernesses he set aside as president, is a historic contribution and um, looms larger in retrospect as, as time goes by. The other legacy, which I think applies to our own time, is his attitude to corporations. He mistrusted rampant corporate enterprise when he felt that it was getting beyond the control of government. And most of his presidency and most of his progressive philosophy was to drum into the American mind the necessity of regulation and control of great corporations. Otherwise, he believed that unfettered, uncontrolled, unregulated, they became amoral and detrimental to the quality of the civilization. I think of applies to our own time as his attitude to corporations. He mistrusted rampant corporate enterprise when he felt that it was getting beyond the control of government. And most of his presidency and most of his progressive philosophy was to drum into the American mind the necessity of regulation and control of great corporations. Otherwise, he believed that unfettered, uncontrolled, unregulated, they became amoral and detrimental to the quality of the civilization. And that philosophy speaks very loudly to us now. Thank you, everybody. It's been great talking to you. Thank you.